Good day, fellas. Welcome to Uncensored Advice for Men. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Mr. Kevin. Welcome to the show. Josh, thank you so much for having me, my friend. I'm excited to see, uh, see where we go. Yeah. All right. So who are you and what do you do? Uh, I am Kevin Palmieri. I am a podcaster, a speaker, a coach, and somebody who just is obsessed with getting better as much as humanly possible. I think there wasn't a lot of self-improvement, personal development in my life when I was younger. And I think having that around would have changed my life in many ways. So now I'm trying to play catch up. Sweet, sweet. All right. So pot, fellow podcaster, yes. love talking to fellow podcasters. What's, uh, what's the name of your show? Uh, my show is Next Level University. We do seven episodes a week and we just recorded our 900th episode yesterday. So that is the main thing I do. I'm blessed to be able to do that every day. Wow. Okay. So you're doing pretty much one a day of your own shows. Yep. And now you're coming on to other people's <laughs> shows. So what does your day look like, Kevin? Oh my goodness. Uh, I'll use today as an example. Uh, alarm clock went off at five o'clock. I do mobility foam roll while listening to a book. I'm at the gym by five 45. I'm there till probably seven 30. Cause I do cardio, come home, shower, feed the cats. And then I am in the office from 8 AM until 5 PM to 8 PM, depending on the night. And every day is a little bit different. Today was coaching call on a podcast, half hour break on a podcast. We're recording three episodes after this, another coaching call, team call, another team call after that. So I have seven or eight different things on Zoom today. Very cool. All right. So you pretty much spend all your life on podcasts. So you must yep. like podcasts. How long have you oh. been doing it? I started in April of 2017 with, it was called the hyper conscious podcast when I started it because most of my life I was living unconsciously and I figured, okay, what is the opposite of that hyper conscious? And I started like everybody else. I started with one episode a week. Uh, it was just a passion project at that point. And I, I learned very quickly how much I loved this whole process. I never wanted to be a speaker. I never wanted to be a coach. I never wanted to be a podcaster. That was never in the cards. But when I did it the first time, something clicked. It was like, oh, this is what people talk about when they say they found their thing. I think I found my thing. And that was, that was the best feeling in the world, honestly. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit. You said, you know, you grew up in a world where you really didn't get exposed to personal development, mm -hmm. self-development. Uh, you felt that you were living unconsciously. Mm -hmm. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so as a, as a kid, I grew up in a single family household. So I was raised by my mom and my grandmother, mom and memes, as I call her. Mm. And there just was a lot of scarcity. There was a lot of, we're not going to be able to make rent this month. Um, you know, here are the, the reasons we can't do these things. College was never really like a, an option for me. I didn't know. I didn't have anybody in my family who knew how to help me apply. I didn't know how to pay for it. So there was a lot of scarcity in my upbringing. And I think that that scarcity is something I never dealt with. So I just went through my life as I saw everybody else doing it. You go get a job, you make money. Hopefully you make enough money to be successful. And then everything kind of happens. And I was a six figure earner at 26. And I remember one day after I opened my, my pay stub to show that I made six figures, I was miserable. Nothing changed, nothing changed with the money. I was just as miserable, if not more miserable. And I think I assumed that was going to fix my life and fix my problems. And it was going to be the shining part of my life, but it wasn't. And that's really when I figured like, okay, for the last 25 years, I've just kind of been going through life waiting for the next thing to happen. I didn't design any of this, none of this that I designed. And that was a, a sobering, painful thought and a lesson, but that is one of the big shifts in my life. I think that self-awareness, the self-awareness of nothing is going to change unless I start changing it. And if it does change, it's not going to be within my control. It might not be sustainable. So when I say I was living unconsciously, that's, that's it. I was relying on luck for everything to happen around me. Yeah. And did luck show up or uh, did quite the opposite happen? <laughs> Believe it or not, luck did show up. Luck yeah. did show up. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Didn't I mean, that one. yeah, I had a, I had a great place where I was living. I had a sports car. I had the body of my dreams cause I had just done a bodybuilding show. Um, you know, my girlfriend at the time was, was a model. Like a lot of the things I, 
I had seemed like I was very successful, but it was the internal game that I was losing. I was winning on the external. Anybody who knew me thought I was crushing it. But when I went to bed at night, I didn't feel like I was crushing it. So for most of my life, I actually felt like I was too lucky. I was a really good athlete. I felt lucky every time I hit a home run. I never planned on hitting a home run. I felt lucky. And I always felt lucky when I did well at work or I did well in school. I, I really thought for most of my life that I lacked talent, but what I lacked in talent, I made up with in luck, unfortunately. Yeah. So this is, this is interesting. I'd love to hear your, your take on this. I, man, I've, the most common message I get on LinkedIn is like, congrats on the new role, congrats on the new whatever. I've been on it for a while. And, but one of the, I was in venture capital, private equity, and, and I built some, some stuff, but lost all my money, been bankrupt on food stamps. Kind of like, I've had this mm -hmm. in my life, right? The ups and downs and, and getting my ass whooped. One of my jobs in between was I built some construction companies and I worked at a, uh, a roofing company selling doors or selling roofs door to door. Hmm. I won a competition and, and we wound up going uh, fishing, right? So we're all sitting on this boat and and the guy's yelling, reel it in, reel it in. And I'm like looking around like, who's the lucky bastard who caught the fish? And then, so I felt the tug. I was like, oh my gosh, it's me. And I'm reeling in, I'm reeling in. The guy's yelling at me. He's like, this is a big one. I'm, I'm going the whole time. This is going to break. The line's going to break. I'm not going to get this thing. I get this thing and I, I caught the biggest fish that day. I was surprised. Like you said, I didn't expect to hit the home run. I didn't expect to win the competition. I didn't expect to catch a big fish. I was surprised that it happened. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 When I was, when I was 11 years old, I was up to bat. My mom was behind the backstop and I, I was, a, I was a very good baseball player. Was, was she good. a catcher? No, no. She was watching. Okay. Okay, <laughs> <catch>. <laughs> and she said in front of everybody, she said, Kevin, if you hit a home run, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And I hit a grand slam on the next pitch. It wasn't because I thought I could. I thought I was lucky. Even in the way I say that you can say, I, I felt lucky that I did that. Yeah. And that, I think that started the journey. I was, I was on every all-star team ever. I was really good. I was really good, but I never felt good. And there's yeah. a difference between getting a result and reverse engineering a result. And I never reverse engineered most of the results in my life. So I didn't feel like they were sustainable. I have a buddy. He is a good looking, successful. Thank you. <laughs> Talking about me, right? Every, of course. Okay. Everything you could ever want in the world but not super confident in his, in his ability to replicate the past relationships he's had. Getting a result versus reverse engineering are two different lives. Yeah. Yeah. So when did this, making six figures, got a six pack, probably an eight pack since you're a bodybuilder, <laughs> right? So you did the, the tannin and yep. you walked around stage and people clapped for you and yep. you're so awesome, Kevin, right? And they're cheering you on, had a hot you know girlfriend and, you know, life seemed perfect, making money, sports car, all this stuff, but yet you feel that you kind of got lucky, like yep. you didn't create this. Like, how did that show up in your life, and, and why did that cause you stress? Why didn't you just look in the mirror and go, damn, awesome, let's just keep going with it? <laughs> I did. I did for a long time, and then my girlfriend left. And when my girlfriend left, I had to look in the mirror. Everything crumbled at the same time. I wasn't making as good of money because work was slow. So it was just this combination of, I lost love. I wasn't nearly as successful financially as I was before. I was living by myself. I was recouping from this bodybuilding show and my hormones were tanked. And I had a, definitely had a minor um, food sickness, like an eating disorder for sure. And it was just this perfect storm of all these things. And I had to realize in that moment, after she left, it was the loneliest thing in the world. I'm sitting in this place by myself and it's just quiet. And not just quiet audibly, but quiet energetically. It was just lonely. It was dark. It was like that soul sucking loneliness of, wow, I think I just lost everything I thought I had. And in a weird way, Josh, I knew I was going to lose it. I yeah. knew that relationship wasn't going to work. And I was counting down the days until it it went away. And when it did, I think part of me was like, Oh, yep. There that is the luck ran out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, do you feel that you like predicted it, created it? Yeah. Like you self-sabotaged yeah. the, the relationship and the success. There, there was a lot of scarcity. There, there was a lot of, 
if I give you a hundred dollars, there's two things you can do. You can go turn that hundred into a thousand and then a million, or you can hang on to it and say, I got a hundred, I got to keep it. I try to keep it. It wasn't about flourishing, flourishing and growing together. It was about staying together. And that's the biggest difference in my relationship. I'm engaged. I have an amazing fiance, the most supportive human of this journey, which is saying a lot because it's been wild, but our main priority is growing together having the difficult, painful, insecure, uncomfortable conversations. It's, that's, I went from trying to get by to dry, trying to grow every single day. And I believe that's why my life is vastly different than it was. It has to be. There's nothing else really changed. My, I mean, my community and my environment, yes, but that goes hand in hand with the amount of commitment to growth I have as well. Mm -hmm. So, how did how did you show up when you were lonely right low energy you felt lonely you, your girl just left you like what did you turn like what were some of the the pathways to get you to one day becoming a coach did you go down any negative paths oh of course yeah of course um luckily for me the gym's always been an outlet that's one thing i will say i've been working out for 16 years so that's always been there for me when when other things haven't but porn for sure heavy into porn uh, a lot of weed for sure. Um, a lot of it's dead weed, end dating. Or it's porn, then weed, because if you do weed first, you don't have the energy or the, the motivation <laughs> to do the porn. Yeah, I mean, it depends, I guess. It depends on what day of the week it was, really. <laughs> yeah. it, it was really. It was really those two things. And then, honestly, what the positive things were me just getting in touch with myself. I started learning. I remember I was listening to audiobooks. And that was the first time ever. And I remember my co-host and, and he's my business partner now, he has been a mentor for me for since the beginning, honestly. He, he's been there and he's taught me so much. And I remember he was like, Kev, you got to download these audiobooks." And I remember thinking, I don't understand what learning about this is going to do for me. I genuinely have no idea why I'm doing this. I'm playing uh, PlayStation 4 while I'm listening to this audiobook. Now, I had to start small, but it was really that. It was having conversations about stuff that mattered. That was yeah. the initial thing for me. And learning about stuff that didn't seem to apply to me yet, which, which was very strange. It was really that. And slowly going from spending time around people who talked about the past to spending time with people who talked about the future. That was huge for me. That was huge. And now I really only talk about the future, really, yeah. and, and, and the current. But the past is where the lessons are, but I don't want to live from that really. Sure. So, uh, your business partner, mm -hmm. right? You said he was a mentor and now business partner co-host. What's that dude's name? Uh, Alan, his name's Alan Lazarus. He is a, a shining example of a human, one of the most intelligent human beings. I do not know how I got so blessed, but he's, he's, a a visionary entrepreneur, who understands exponential organizations and wants to change the world. So I got very lucky that him and I have similar core values, core beliefs, and core aspirations for sure. Very cool. What, what's a nickname that you call him or that he Jeff. calls you? Jeff. We call each other Jeff. One day I pulled up to the studio and I, when I pulled up, this, so the studio is at his mom's house in the beginning of his journey. Yeah. When I pulled up, I would text him, I am here. And one day it auto-corrected to I am Jeff. And now we just call each other Jeff and that's like, <laughs> Our whole community says Jeffing. It's this whole thing. So if you're out there and your name is Jeff, I do love you. It doesn't mean anything negative, but it's just an inside joke that we have that's now not inside anymore. Yeah, now it's out into the whole <laughs> world. So holy crap, 900 episodes. So you're doing an episode a day. So you've been doing this for a while, right? Yep. In, in your journey of podcasting, uh, why did you start podcasting? And what's, what's one thing that you, you feel like it was – it got you hooked. Like, why are, why are you addicted to podcasting? I started because I had the capability of being more vulnerable than most people, just right off the bat. And I was willing to ask questions and talk about stuff that other people weren't. And that's, that's why I started. My first interview was with one of my, or my second interview was with one of my buddies who wanted to commit suicide. And we walked through his story of how he was in the bathroom thinking about it and somebody came up to him and told him not to do it. And it was this whole, this whole amazing story. And I ended up going to the hospital with him. 
to make sure he didn't do that. That was one of my, that was my second episode ever. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I knew that people had to hear stuff like that. And I knew that not a lot of people wanted to talk about it. And I was willing to be that martyr for that, for that cause, so to speak. And I think the reason I fell in love with it is because I could actually be myself. If, if, if somebody listens to us, they listen to the real us. I mean, 900 episodes, I, there's only so much I could fake at this point, right? So yeah. I fell in love with it because I could sit down in front of a microphone and talk about what I wanted to talk about and people actually resonated with it. And I could be authentic. It's like when I'm in front of the microphone, I get to be all of me. Yeah. When I go to the grocery store, I kind of can't. I don't want to say can't. But not everybody resonates with, hey, have you gotten better today? Like, are you trying to chase your dreams? You know, it's that's a lot for some people. Yeah. Understandably, that was a lot for me. But in front of this microphone on podcasts, I get to be me. And that's just a, it's a freeing, amazing feeling. Yeah. I don't feel, and I'd love your thoughts on this. I don't feel like the world is ready for the full out Josh. <laughs> and that's why I have an uncensored advice for Mencha. Like, you know, like, I don't know if the world's ready for you know, me to talk about, you know, like if I, if I exit this door right here you know, out of our studio, talk about masturbation, talk about porn, talk about weed, talk about all the things or insecurities or failures or bankrupt or all, all the things that, you know, thoughts of suicide and depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and all the things that guys go through internally, or at least I have. Mm. I don't know if a lot of people are, are fully ready for that, you know, that, that, that experience, but yeah. here... I feel that for the people who listen in and, and who invest in themselves, I feel like they want that. Yeah. Is that what you get out of your mm -hmm. audience and, you, and, the, and the people who reach out to you? Yeah. So believe it or not, our audience from the very beginning was predominantly women. Oh, cool. Never expected that. I never expected that. But you got to think it's two bodybuilders who aren't talking about bodybuilding things. We're talking about feelings, mental health, habits, relationships, fears, insecurities. So we had a very, very heavy women following in the beginning. And I've learned so much about human beings, particularly women, particularly emotionally driven women. It's been wonderful. And that's helped me in so many different ways. But yeah, it really was in, you got to think of like a frequency on a frequency spectrum. At one point, the highest paid person on television was Judge Judy. Why is that? Because there's more people that play at that frequency of watching Judge Judy. That's okay. The Kardashians. I don't watch the Kardashians. It's, it's low vibe. And that's okay. That's, there's a place for that. I love Superbad, my favorite movie of all time. But you know what it is? It's low vibe. I'm not going to necessarily get better and change the world if I'm listening, watching that every day. And I think that what you're talking about is very high vibe. And there is a smaller percentage of people statistically who play at that high vibe. So it makes sense. Like you're not statistically, you're going to come across more people who want to talk about the weather than they want to talk about their feelings right. because that's just the frequency that many people are at. Again, I was the same way when I was watching porn and doing what I was doing. So I'm, I'm not speaking negatively about that. I was just playing at a different frequency and that, that's all it really was. Yeah. And you know, in this in this journey, uh, what I found with with podcasting is is one. I I went through some really really just terrible times, and it, it became free consulting. It became free coaching. It became yep. free therapy. Like I've interviewed people, and I broke down crying, and they're like, <laughs> and I'm like, might as well record it, right? And share that with the world because if it helps another dude out there, that that's cool. Um, in in the 900 episodes that you've done, what's one that like stands out that you're like, man? it really impacted you as a host mm. and maybe you didn't expect it. Oh man. Um, it's not that I didn't expect it. It's, it was, I was surprised at some of the content we int uh, interviewed somebody two, two weeks ago, last week, one of those two, his name is Kevin Hines mm -hmm. and he jumped off the golden gate bridge in an attempt to commit suicide and survived. And his story is just, it's unreasonable what that human being has gone through in terms of upbringing. At one point in the interview, he said his diet as a child, early child, infant, was Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk. That's what he ate living in a, in a hotel because his parents were addicted to drugs. And 
the thing that really hit me is during the interview, he said, guys, I think about suicide all the time. It is, I'm, I'm, it's always, it's constant. And I didn't think about that. In the interview process, when you're doing research, you look at somebody's story, you look at where they've been, you look at where they are, you look at where they're going. I didn't think about the fact that he might still be dealing with it. Yeah. You think of the heroes, the, the guide. He's now the guide who's gotten through it. He's still going through it. And it was just, it was a real moment for me of, oh yeah, they're behind these stories. There's always a human being. Yeah. And that human being wakes up Monday through Friday and they wake up Saturday and Sunday too. And they're living a real life besides what they're talking about on this podcast. That was real. That was, it was a heavy episode where afterwards I told Alan, I said, I need a minute. And that was just heavy. That was a heavy, heavy episode. And that, that one definitely impacted me. Another one, Anthony trucks. I don't know if you know, Anthony, but he'd be a good guest for you for sure. He grew up in the foster system. And at one point he was forced to lick the bottom of shoes until his tongue bled. And he had to chase a chicken around a backyard in order to catch his food. Uh -huh. And now he's a world-class speaker. He played in the NFL, American Ninja Warrior, amazing guy. We've interviewed him a couple of times and, and got to hang out with him behind the scenes. But the adversity some humans have gone through is just mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll share, uh, we'll share some guests. Cause I've, I've got some, that sure, please. I, I think you'd love to connect with as well. Um, in your personal growth, like what do you think was the biggest challenge? Cause you started out being the hyper conscious guy, mm. right? And then, and then it became the next level, you know, like in your own personal growth, what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome? This is going to sound, and I share this because I think a lot of us probably deal with this. My ego trying to keep me safe is so I didn't say Alan is spectacular as like a, uh, as an over-exaggeration, like this, he's the kind of kid who changes the world and that's just who he is. And I'm talking Steve jobs, Elon Musk type. And that sounds crazy. I know, but that has been the biggest challenge for me is keeping up with him and looking in mirrors and understanding, you know what? I might've started this whole thing. He, sh I shouldn't be the CEO. He should be. That's unreasonably difficult to admit that I'm not even number one in my own quote unquote company. Mm. And that level of removing the ego and saying, you know what, maybe I'm not the best at this. Maybe there is somebody that I work with who's better. That has been so challenging for me over the last five years. Um, because it's a mirror that you're not always ready to look into. And it's a mirror that I have to look into constantly. Every time I talk to Alan, I look in that mirror of, oh yeah, I'm the CFO, but you understand finances better than I do. Oh, I'm the whatever, but you understand this. So I think all of us in our lives at some point, there's been a moment of not enoughness, whether it's real or not, perceived or actual. And we find a way to compensate, whether it's egoing up or shelling up and that has been the biggest challenge for me, whether in the public eye, on stage, behind the scenes, talking to business, talking life, talking money, that has been the biggest issue for me. Now, what is, it's created a level of humility in me that I'm very grateful for, but it's still, it's not easy. It's definitely still a challenge and I'm sure it will be probably forever. Yeah. I am a dude with a massive ego, right? And like life had to kick me in the ass multiple times and, and God gave me all the opportunities to, to be humbled. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, in the process, I was talking to a, a guy, he's, you know, venture capitalist guy, and he was going, uh, before, before bankruptcy and then after bankruptcy, moving back in with mom and dad with wife and three kids and all going through the process of moving back into a small town is, uh, I, I, I called the guy a few years later. And he goes, Josh, you sound different. He goes, to be honest, you were an arrogant prick <laughs> prior to this, you know? And he goes, no, we could probably do, do something together, do a deal together. Mm -hmm. My ego got in the way of a lot of my success. And it's funny, and I'd love your thoughts on this too, is my ego was really a lot of my insecurities acting out because yeah. I, I, I was good at a lot of things. You know, I have natural talents in meeting with people, and some sports like wrestling or something like that. But other than that, I, I'm not really talented. But even in those things, people would be like, wow, you're great at that. And I'm like, nah, no, I'm not. 
but my ego would go on the mat and then act out, right? Mm -hmm. So do you find that your ego was actually some like insecurities that you were trying to cover up and overcompensate yeah. for? Yeah. Yeah. I I believe most people walk around and their biggest fear is somebody finding out their biggest fear. Yeah. I really, I really believe that. And it was that my biggest fear was people were going to not see me as the, the lead. That was my biggest fear. So much, in fact, that looking back, a lot of our episodes are way less value valuable than they should be because Alan was asking me questions I should have been asking him. I should have been asking Alan about sales, not the other way around. He'd been doing it for many years longer than I had, right? So the need to be valuable or the need to be the shining object, that was out of the insecurity of people valuing me less than I wanted to be valued, for sure, 100%. Yeah. Now I, I asked that in a very long way, by the way, I, like, I, sh I should have been a lot more precise. Like <laughs> no, context matters. Context <laughs> matters, Josh. Yeah. All right. So you're going through this process. At what point did you're like, all right, I'm going to be a coach. I'm going to be a speaker, a podcaster. What, what the heck did that look like? Yeah. Uh, I became a coach when I no longer could pay the bills pretty much. That was kind of how it, it started. When we started this podcast, there weren't as many resources as there are today in terms of how to make money and how to monetize and grow and scale. So I messaged one of our listeners and said, Hey, I'm running this beta testing for coaching. I've never done it before, but I'm, I want to try. And I started coaching this person. Her name was Jenna. She's on our team now, which is amazing. And after a month or two, I said, I can't do this for free anymore because my schedule was starting to fill up with other things, but I'd love to do it for, I think it was $75 a week. And that was how I started. I started with $75 a call and it was mindset peak performance and it's evolved so much. I don't even do mindset peak performance anymore. Now I only do podcast coaching, but you, you had something. What, what do you have a breakthrough? No, what, what's cool. And, and I, I love this because I think a lot of coaches kind of like stumble into coaching, mm. right? And at least a lot of the good ones, um, you're, you couldn't pay the bills. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and here you are going to talk to someone about, you know, I'm going to coach you. Yeah. Was there an imposter syndrome? Like oh, you can't even pay your bills. What are you going to yeah. do? Coach someone yep. how to be successful. You're not, you know, like did that pop up? Yeah. Oh, it, uh, it still does. Yeah. It's still, it still pops up. It's, I it think, it, I think it depends on who you're comparing to yeah. because, okay. Statistically speaking, we have one of the most successful podcasts in the world. Statistically speaking, right? We have 900 episodes, just crossed half a million downloads. And we're on pace to do a half a million dollars this year through the podcast. Statistically speaking, that is just so rare. But I still have moments when I'm teaching people that it's like, oh my God, this isn't valuable at all. Like they're not, this isn't valuable. This isn't worth whatever. But it always is checking in with, okay, compared to who? Like, who are we comparing to? Tony Robbins? Sure, he's more successful. But statistically speaking, most people aren't. So I think getting with the data, where is the proof is the right, the question to ask. Where is the proof that is running this story in my head? Oh, the, the not being good enough because your dad walked out for the last 30 years, you've always been running this. Even when you were better than you thought, you've always been running it. So it really is getting out of unconsciousness and tapping into hyper-consciousness and then recalibrating, then recalibrating. And then you have new proof to look at. But my long answer to that question, yes, there is still imposter syndrome to this day. Yeah, dude, so awesome. Uh, well, I love these conversations because what I think people see when they see you know, you on TV or YouTube or, you know, like they, they think that you're like untouchable. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people forget, like people say, Hey, Josh, I saw you on the commercial or I saw you on this or that. And like, and they're like, man, you're crushing it. And they're like, how are you doing? And then, they, you know, like, I'm like, dude, I'm having a really rough day. And they're like, what? No. You know, like, and it, I think that this, the world so expects a, the, the gurus on TV to not have emotion, the people up on mm -hmm. stage to not have rough days or have failed businesses or failed this or that, you know, um, how do you deal with the imposter syndrome that, that pops up even today? I just talk about it. I, I really think that imagine if I had never talked about it before, Josh, and you asked me that question, I'd have to lie. 
yeah. I'd have to say, oh no, I, I can't, I don't want anybody to hear this. Cause what if somebody from our community hears it? And this is a different platform, but then they're going to look at me differently. I just try to own it. I try to own the fact that I'm five foot four and I'm terrified that I'm too short. I'm terrified of that. I, that's been a fear since I've, for as long as I can remember, I'm terrified of that. Biggest insecurity I have is being short, but what is the alternative? I buy shoes with lifts in them. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's not going to help me. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. So I think it's honestly being truthful with yourself and then others, and then continuing to check in with the proof of, are there people out there that know more about podcasting than me? For sure. Definitely. Will I run into one this week? Probably not. Most likely not. Cause I've just studied more. I mean, I have 900 reps and five years of studying every day. So I try to just get right with the data. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm losing weight, but the scale does. The scale knows. The scale always knows. The scale is a number. There's no emotions attached to that. It's binary. You either did or you didn't. And when you track your weight, you understand what to do differently. When you track your finances, you either made money this month or you didn't. There's no, I thought I did. Cool, but you didn't or you did. And I think your emotions, if you can get data around them, it helps you make better, more statistically aligned decisions. Now, if you asked me that five years ago, I wouldn't have said any of that because I didn't know what spreadsheets were. But again, as part of this journey, that's something that I've really leaned into. Yeah. I love the fact that, you know, I, I said, how do you deal with it? And you go, I talk about it. Right? Yeah. Like guys don't, we don't typically do that. Like, Hey, what are you insecure about? Well, when it's cold and wet, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about, you know, how big my dong is or like yeah. how tall I am or how much money is in my bank account. Like don't look over my shoulder when I'm looking at my bank account or don't do this or that. Right. So guys, we're walking through life with massive amounts of insecurities and you're like, well, talk about it. Right. Yeah. That, that's not how we're trained no. to do. No, but I, I think it's, Okay, worst case scenario, best case, worst case, most likely scenario. Worst case scenario, somebody listening to this has a bad day. They mm -hmm. find me on Instagram, they DM me and say, hey, you're short and you suck. Worst case scenario. I mean, worst case is they track me down and hurt me. That's like worst yeah. case, yeah. right? Uh, best Someone case scenario. Someone like angry at short people. <laughs> just like yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it exists, right? So <laughs> that's wor absolute worst case. Best case scenario, somebody reaches out, best case scenario. I mean, best case, somebody mails me a million dollars and says that was the best podcast interview and I've you ever heard. It with me. Yeah, of course, naturally. Okay. <laughs> um, but most likely, best case is somebody reaches out and says, "Hey, you talking about that really impacted me." Yeah. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Most likely scenario is closer to best case than it is worst case. Yeah. So it's like your fears about what will happen are probably worse than what's actually going to happen. Now, I was at a party one time. And it was the end of the night and there was these two girls and I was drunk and I was, I was flirting with these two girls. And one of them literally said to my face, Kev, you're way too short for us. So I actually faced my biggest fear and I egoed up and I said, do you even have any idea how much money I make? Of course, that's where I went because I was making money. And in retrospect, facing my biggest quote unquote fear, my biggest insecurity, it wasn't that bad. If it happened today, honestly, yeah, maybe I'm not your cup of tea. Maybe I am too short for you. That exists, right? That exists. I'm okay with that. Maybe I'm not your cup of tea. That's okay. Okay, I don't date guys with tattoos. Okay, I have tattoos. And it is what it is, right? So I think it's that level of, if I could change it, I would, but I can't. I change what I can. If I can't change it, I either hide from it forever or I just, I just allow it to be part of who I am. And it is part of who I am, so I can't hide from it. Yeah. Do you ever lean in the opposite direction where you like make fun of your yourself? Because yeah. I, I mean, people make fun of me, and then I'll just take over and I'll make more fun of myself than than they do. Yeah. I think I think part of that is coping for yeah, sure, totally. for sure. Because I use always used to joke about not having a dad. I always yeah. used to joke about it because I don't want anybody else to call me out on it. So yeah, now. It's interesting because I'd say something on a live, we do live podcasts every week and somebody on the team would say, Kev, don't talk down about yourself. And I would always say, I know you think I am. And I know you think I'm, I'm internalizing that, but I'm not, I'm just very comfortable in whatever I'm talking about. You'll know if I do it subconsciously from like a, a step back point, but yeah, I, I definitely do. And I think it's, 
it's dangerous because it gives permission to other people to joke too. So you got to do it with the right people and maybe not publicly like you and I probably do, but yeah, I definitely do for sure. Yeah. I had to do this. I was at a, we have a Bible study group that we connect with other couples and, and we were talking about something and I, and I made a joke and then I followed up, you know, the joke was like, it was probably like, I don't know. It was insensitive. It was stupid, right? It was dumb, but it was kind of cracking. And I had to go back and I go, Hey guys, I just want you to know that I joke around when I get nervous. That's mm -hmm. how I coped with things in the past when I was a, a firefighter or a medic and I dealt with a lot of death. Like one of the ways we cope with uncomfortable situations, which is my love language, I love uncomfortable situations, by the way, mm -hmm. is we joke about it. We, we make fun of it and then it, it, it's a way where we can talk about it in a way. So coping, you know, there's healthy coping, non-healthy coping, non-healthy coping. So now here you are, podcasting, coaching, speaking, how old are you? Uh, 32. 32. Cool. 30, 32 years old. We have an ability to, you know, go back in time and you could, you could talk to your, what was like a milestone that was like the most pivotal, painful area right before you cross it? What was it like an age for you? 25. Okay. So you could go have a conversation with yourself at 25. What's something that you would say to yourself? I, I get that question a lot. And I love the question. It's so hard because I know, I don't think I would have listened, you yeah. know, because I, I just think I would have been like, no, this is the way. But if I could go back and tell myself anything, I would say, Kev, your life will start getting better when you do. I never understood that. I never understood not even getting things done productivity, but the capability of a human being determine so many of their opportunities and everything that they get. I never understood that because I think I looked up to people who kind of got lucky yeah. for the longest time, Josh, and maybe it's similar for you. When it came to podcasting, Joe Rogan was my idol. Yeah. Joe Rogan was my idol and I don't follow him as much because I just don't have time, uh, you know, in terms of the content I, I take in, but Joe Rogan got lucky kind of, Joe Rogan doesn't know the most about podcasting and marketing and speaking and all that. He started earlier than many people and he just kept the train rolling and he already had a name and he's really good. I mean, he's a world-class interviewer, so I'm not saying that, but he didn't reverse engineer. I'm going to have the most successful podcast in the history of the world. That's not what he did. So I saw somebody like that and I I didn't know what it meant. I assumed that either he got lucky or he knew more than I did. And it really, it really threw me for a loop. And I think we look up to these people like movie stars and we assume they know way more than us. I think they're probably better at one thing. I mean, there's a really good chance that they're just really good at acting and they're not necessarily good at other things. Yeah. And I, I think that you see them and you assume they're better, but better at what? Better at, relationships. I mean, a lot of famous people get divorces better with money. I mean, so many people go bankrupt. So it's like, it, it starts to make sense that if you get better at everything, health, wealth, life, and love, that is our jam health. I do not want to be wealthy and single and miserable. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be wealthy and overweight and out of shape. I don't want to be, um, in an amazing relationship and out of shape and have no money. I want it all. I want to have everything holistically. If you improve in these facets of life, everything around you will improve. And that's what I would have told myself. And now I believe that. I don't know if I would have at the time. Yeah. So now we've already talked to the 26 year old, you're 32. Now we get an opportunity to go into the future mm. and you could have a conversation, you, me and future Kevin sitting on a rocking chair, drinking some scotch or, coffee or whatever you drink. I'm, I'm probably doing scotch, okay. but you get a, you get to give yourself advice of the future self. So you could, you could share something with the future self. Mm. Listen, future self. What would you tell your future self? Don't lose the chip on your shoulder, no matter what, no matter what the house looks like, no matter how many cars you have, no matter how big the audience is, do not lose the chip that got you here. Because if you do, you will lose everything with it. That it's, what? What's the chip? Not being good enough, being doubted, uh, not having a dad. That will always run me. That will always, and I, and I don't want to say run me. It will always motivate me. 
I want it to be gasoline in the tank. I don't want it to be the foot on the pedal. There's a difference between the two, but I, a lot of people aren't necessarily playing for their mission or their purpose. There's a lot of things that you can be motivated by. You can be motivated by uh, mating. You can be motivated by movement and freedom, being able to do whatever you want. You can be motivated by materials and possessions, and you can be motivated by mastery, being the best in the world. But you can also be motivated by your mission. That I don't, I don't ever want to lose sight of. The, the only reason I am where I am is because of the mission. Everything else is great, but it's because of the mission. It's because of the impact. It's because of the value. And so much of that has come, in, has come from the chip on my shoulder. So don't ever take your foot off the gas. Don't ever forget why this actually worked. And this part too, don't ever try to convince people it's easier than it is. Don't ever, you're, you're going to have so much momentum in 30 years that everything is just going to seem easier. Don't ever give that terrible advice to somebody who's just starting out. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Hey, fellas out there, this is tough as hell, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, there's nothing easy about, about life except, you know, just letting things go. Um, in your, in your journey to becoming a coach, what is the, the thing that people most come and ask you for help? Like what is the, the pain point that most people are going, Hey, Kevin, I need help. Mm. So since I work with podcasters predominantly, it's making money. So many people have told them they can't make money. Mm -hmm. Like you can't make money with a podcast. It's like, all right, well you can, I don't know who told you, you couldn't. I, mm -hmm. I hope it was a seasoned podcaster who told you that you couldn't make money. It's like, well, no, I, I just know like so many people have told me it's like, well, I, I hope you, you love this person dearly, but do they have a podcast? Do they even listen to podcasts? <laughs> no. Oh, so they probably don't know. Right. That would be the biggest one is, uh, yeah. It's either that or it's the like complete opposite of, I know I'm going to crush it. I just need a little bit of guidance. And it's like, I love that level of confidence and self-belief, but you're not that good yet. So we need to like do some refining. So it depends on the person, but more often than not, it's how do I make more money with my podcast really? And for many people, it's just me saying, you can make money with your podcast. And it's this breakthrough of- yeah. Oh, I didn't think you can. And yeah, here's, here's five ways you can. You definitely can. Will you stick out long enough to do it? I don't know. That's up to you and that's up to me if you want to do that. But that's the biggest one for sure. Word. So in, in this journey, right, you, you found, you, you started in coaching and it was mindset. Mm -hmm. And then here it shifts into podcasting. Will you ever go back to mindset or lifestyle design or this or that? No, Why I don't, not? I don't study it now to master it. And I think I, there was a part of me, and this was recent when I started transitioning, I transitioned in the last year, I texted one of my clients, I sent an audio message and I said, Hey, I feel as if I'm doing you a disservice because you're not, you're kind of not my main priority. And I can't, I can't continue coaching you knowing that I'm not trying to learn as much as possible about the style of coaching I'm doing. I want to grow the podcast business more. It's more aligned for me. It just, it just is. I love it more. And, and I think I can help people in a different way because we've had to take a different road. So yeah, it's, unless somebody came to me and they said, here's an ungodly amount of money. And like, I know it's not your main thing then I'd probably do it again, but I don't anticipate it, no. Yeah. How do you know you're winning? Oh, that's a great question. What's your mission and how do you know you're doing it? Our mission, and it's wild, uh, to have the most successful podcasts ever of all time in the self-improvement industry in terms of impact, in terms of really, really helping somebody's life, not motivating them and saying, oh, you got to work harder and grind your face up. Not that a holistic approach to actually have a better, more next level life. So that is our mission to put self-improvement into the pocket of every human being seven days a week from anywhere in the world for free. That is, that is our mission. How do we know we're winning? So again, we're very numbers driven. Thanks to Alan. So thank you, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, 
every day I track our finances. I track our listens. I track our Facebook group. I just track a bunch of numbers. So we, we really know whether or not we're winning and we have growth rates on, you know, how fast are we accelerating the acceleration of the podcast? So it goes pretty deep there, but I think you have to feel something different. And before the, the money and before all that, I still felt like I was winning compared to what I used to do. So I think it depends. If you, I know I'm winning when I find perspective of the best it ever was is still not as good as it is on my worst day today. Not even close, not even close. Six years ago, I would be working in an attic somewhere, sweating and cursing and breathing in stuff I shouldn't be. And I'd be six hours away from home, staying in a crusty hotel. Anything today where I get to work from home in my pajamas. You're wearing pajamas? Is, I'm in my, now bottom half. Okay. Top half business, bottom nice. half casual, right? Yeah. And that is for me, that's how I know I'm winning is I'm more fulfilled now than I ever have been. I'm yeah. way more fulfilled. I'm way more on purpose. I'm way more aligned. It's just, it's a different life. Kevin, let's see your pajamas. What are you wearing? You want to see them? Yeah. I got tacos. That's... Oh, nice. Yeah. Taco pants. Taco pants. Those are very yeah. good taco pants. Yeah. I, I love pajamas. I'm, you know, I, I like to be comfortable. Yeah. And you know what? It fits you, man. I appreciate that. I yeah. appreciate that very much. So, you got a bunch of tattoos. Yeah. Right. What was your first tattoo? Oh man. So, uh, if you're out there, maybe you made the same mistake or perceived mistake I did. I got barbed wire around my. You can't see it anymore, but this was barbed yeah. wire. Yeah. But it got got covered up. So okay. yeah, I got my my mom took me when I was 16. You and mom got tattoos together. We didn't know. She she had a bunch. She, my okay. mom has like eight tattoos. Sweet. So she she was all about it. But she took me to some basement when I was 16 years old and somebody who should not have been tattooing me was tattooing me. Yeah. And it was brutal. But I got barbed wire with blood dripping out of it at 16. Yeah. Why, why barbed wire? <laughs> who knows? That's what everybody was getting yeah, the, the just, ar around the arm. It makes your yeah, arm look a little bit bigger. It looked cool. And yeah. I was like, I'm, this is... I'm badass, number one. And number two, I don't. I was like the only person in my school, I think, in my grade yeah. at least, who had a tattoo. I was like, it doesn't really matter. I could get anything and people are going to think this is cool. Yeah, totally. <laughs> if I, I've got a few, uh, but if, here's, here's the question is, I don't know why I told, I got some too. We're, we're like each other. That, I get think that that's probably why I said that. But if, if I had a magic pen and I erased every tattoo on your body except for one, which one would you keep? And you're not allowed to get any more. You okay. one tattoo. I'd probably keep this. I'd probably keep the the never quit. It it's on his arm. It says never quit. Got it. Yeah. I would probably keep that because that is that's just who I am. I I've I've always been willing to suffer for what I believed in. Like I was again, I was a good baseball player, but one of the reasons I was good is because I was reckless. I was diving head first. I always slid head first. I jumped over catchers. I was just reckless. When I used to do martial arts. I'd roll with anyone. And I often, I mean, I got choked out. I got arm barred, all the things all the time, but it's that, it's that moment when somebody has a choke locked in and you know, you're most likely going to get choked out. How long do you fight before you tap? I used to fight until I saw stars and like things get very quiet and you start to get the hum and you're moments away from going out. Like I've always tried to fight through that. So that's my persona. That's, that's who I am. I, I want to be the person who perseveres and just has the most resilience. So that tattoo speaks to me in a way that I don't think any, any other really does, but yeah, that's, that's a deep one for me. Were you like Nogi, uh, wrestling or both? You, okay. Both. Yeah. I was, I didn't understand the gi at the beginning. I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah. It looks kind of like karate, but I, I enjoyed it. It's, it built a level of humility in me that I think everybody needs. When you you go grapple with somebody who stereotypically doesn't look like they'd be very strong, and the next thing you know, your leg's over your head, and you're like, yeah. oh, okay, that's there's something to this. It's a very, very humbling experience knowing that somebody could kill you with their bare hands if they wanted to. And sure. you don't get to experience that very often legally, so it was good. Yeah, I love this. All right, so you and I are standing up face-to-face, -face, or you and someone else, doesn't matter. 
what's what's one of your go-to moves like you're like this is right off the mat like this is going to be one of my <laughs> one of my attack moves so i have a low center of gravity which in this case is very good ankle so, pick double leg yeah i was i was never really a double leg I'm yeah. more like, let me just get double underhooks and let me, if I can clasp my hands, there's a pretty good chance I can get you down. So yeah. that was kind of always my thing. Now I'm very stocky. So, you know, you're not going to see a ton of triangle chokes, arm bars. That's not my jam because my legs are very short, but I was always good at the head and arm choke because mm -hmm. I could lock it up really tight. So that was, that was where I would go if I was on the ground. Um, but I always, I really enjoy kickboxing. I like Muay Thai and kickboxing way more. Really? Yeah. My, my grandfather was a professional boxer. My great grandfather was a professional. They didn't use gloves back then. So Fair he was enough. also a, a boxer as well. And it's just like my whole family is a bunch of fighters. So it's, that's just, I love it. I love it. I'm so excited to watch the, the fights this weekend. I'm a huge combat sports fan. So yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Super cool. Very cool. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I have a deck of cards that kind of have questions on it. Okay. We're coming out towards the end of our interview, but uh, my little brain only comes up with so many cool <laughs> questions. So I got a deck of cards with questions on it. So tell me when to stop. Stop. All right. So we're going to ask you this question. Okay. All right. Imagine your daily routine had been turned into a reality show. Oh, man. Which parts would be the most talked about? I don't know. I feel like it would just be Groundhog Day. It would just be like the same thing every day. Probably the gym. I, I There's not much else that's super shiny. I mean, if you value seeing me on podcasts, you'd see that pretty often. I would say the gym because the gym is a side of me that most people don't know. And most people don't see it. Like I'm a bodybuilder. I don't, a lot of people in the self-improvement industry, and this is somewhat blanket, but like you know, they go in the gym and they do their thing because they want to continue looking good. Like I go in there and I get under heavy weight and I suffer. I want to, I want to really feel it. So th I think that part of it, or me doing martial arts, because it's a different side. It's just not, you might not guess that listening to an episode like this. That's what I would say. Yeah. I think martial arts and being in the gym and lifting heavy stuff and, and those kind of things, um, especially fighting for me, it built my confidence. Mm. Once again, pretty talented dude in a few different areas, but like very insecure, right? Low self-esteem, very insecure. Fighting gave me a way to build confidence. Martial arts gave me a way to build confidence and, and get some traction under my belt. Um, what is th the segue? Segueing into, let, let's talk about your coaching because we, we got a few minutes left and I think that's important. For, for people in the audience, right, who the guys out there who are, you know, maybe struggling with something and, and they, they are, um, they are reaching out to you. What, what would be the best way to reach out to you, connect with you, maybe do a deal with you, connect, you know, yeah. Yeah, send me, or something. A, send me a DM, uh, at never quit kid. I'll send, I will literally send you a video back. I try to send videos to everybody that is a new follower, a new friend, whatever it is. I, I try it's, it's more difficult because there's more going on, but I think it's, I think it's personal. So yeah, you can reach out. And honestly, like if it's mindset stuff, I'm, I'll help you. I probably won't send you a package or say, Hey, let's do this. Like, just send me what you're dealing with and I'll send you an audio back about what I would do. But yeah, that's, that's never quit kid on Instagram or Kevin at next level universe is my, my email. Very cool. One last question. What question like, should I, should I have asked you in this interview? Right. Cause we kind of went this rabbit trail and had some fun, you know, just discussing other things that, you know, what, what question do you wish I would ask you? Or do you wish someone would ask you? Hmm. That's a good one. That might be the one. No, I can't <laughs> use a cop out. I yeah. would say, what do I wish you would have asked me? How do you know when you'll be successful? Like, how yeah. do you actually know when you'll be? Like, what will the, what's the line of demarcation from going to, or going from where you are to actual success? That's, that's a good question. Take it. I don't know that I ever will. <laughs> I don't know that I, because I feel successful now. I feel successful now. When I, this, this is the answer. 
when I feel as confident internally is the results I have externally. That's when I will feel successful because that's the game we're all playing in anyway. Yeah. Yeah. When the external matches the internal. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's success. Cause then you're, you're showing up in true authenticity and transparency with the world. That's yep. when you've made it. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm working on that. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> All right. One more place. Uh, what, what's a good place for, for people to find out more information about you? Do you guys have a website? Yeah. Yeah. Nextleveluniverse.com. And, uh, you can check out the podcast seven episodes a week on every single platform, including YouTube. We will never miss. That is our promise to ourselves and to our, our audience. I will, I will podcast from the hospital. If I have to, we will do whatever it takes to make sure we keep the content flowing. That is our, our main thing. Cool. Fellas in the audience, as always, reach out to our guests, say thank you. All their contact information will be in the show notes. Skip me, go straight to them. Uh, say, Hey, appreciate you being on the show and find a way to do a deal with them, work with them, ask some questions, get some coaching with them, offer some value to them. Um, but as always, reach out to our guests, say thank you. I uh, hope you guys are having an awesome freaking day. If you're struggling with something or need someone to talk with, head on over to uncensoredadviceformen.com. Fill out a quick form. I, I try to call everybody as soon as a, a lead or not a lead. This isn't the business podcast. This is my impact show. As soon as your email hits my thing, I, I, I try to call all the dudes. And, um, and we've had a few people that are going through some awesome stuff and a few people going through some tough stuff. So... You're not alone. We've got a show for you. If you want to come talk on it, uncensoredadviceformen.com. Talk to you all on the next one. See you guys.